making sure a lot of our creators come from the communities that are affected by the issues that we're covering, like development and policing. So that, of course, does require um, ideally resources. So. Um, the other thing I'll just mention that we did also spend the money on is not just content contributors, um, but also we did uh, pay our co-founders a small bit for the first time so that we didn't have to have as many side hustles um, while we do matter so that we could be a little bit more efficient at our jobs because we are all three, um, you know, up to that point where 100% volunteer. I had a full-time government job. You had full-time jobs and running your own business on the side so that um, we, you know, we were really scattered. So having a little bit of money, we're not paid full-time, but, you know, having a little bit of money to work on matter really goes a long way. So that was huge for us in, in 2020. Now, let's talk a little bit, um, for those of you that aren't familiar, Marissa, maybe first go a little bit into what Develop Us is and what that investigation is. Um, but I just want to hear a little bit about, um, you know, since we're here tonight, mostly to talk about what we did with the money. So we just talked a little bit about, about like, literally what we spent the money on was the people to create the content. Tell us a bit about the Develop Us investigation and what kind of content was able to be produced this year with that money. Um, maybe what are some of the pieces that you think are most noteworthy that we've put out? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so in terms of development, um, when the, well, let me back up. Uh, to give, to give you some context, um, so longtime readers and longtime viewers uh, and followers of Matter will know that our very first investigation was actually uh, develop uh, development. Um, so we titled our investigation called Develop Us, uh, modeled after you know Columbus um, and how they kind of do all their fun little slogans uh, using U.S. and and you know kind to kind of bring that community to feeling to it. Um, and so we titled our, our investigation into development, Develop Us. And from there, we look at the process um, uh, of change uh, to people, uh, you know, our kind of community and businesses um, as the city grows, as more people fill in, you know, come uh, and, and migrate to Columbus and, and as kind of our economy changes as well. Um, a lot of these kind of big, you know, picture uh, ideas and topics, um, we really wanted to kind of look at them as a whole, uh, you know, when it comes to development, because there's a lot that goes into, you know, that one word. Uh, it, it means everything from housing development to job growth to, you know, even transportation. Um, um, and so that it all of those topics are something that affects absolutely everyone in this city. And so that's one reason why we decided to start with uh, development is because, you know, it's 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 one of the the most uh, prominent things that you can see throughout Columbus is the, just the dramatic change that's happened over the past five, 10, 15, 20 years. Um, and I've only been in Columbus, you know, a short uh, amount of that time, right, that this change has happened. But even in the time that I've been here, um, since when I was a freshman at Ohio State University uh, to now, it, it the change is, is so dramatic. And so we wanted to make sure that we were kind of looking, you know, diving deeper and going into the root causes of why are some of these things changing. Um, so kind of fast forwarding from that a little bit to uh, content that we've worked on this year. Um, when the, uh, you know, so just like every other business, we had to really pivot kind of what we were doing and the way that we were doing things and how we find stories and how we talk to everyday people um, when the pandemic hit. And so um, in March, you know, one of the, one of the biggest things, um, you know, that we, uh, felt like we could contribute in kind of this pandemic, you know, development uh, kind of situation was looking at evictions. And so Jalen Grisso, who um, is not with us tonight, uh, had done some excellent reporting on uh, what the kind of eviction problem looks like, like what that landscape was, um, what housing experts were saying about that, um, kind of what the numbers were in terms of how many people were being evicted. Uh, and follow that up with a second piece about a variety of solutions. And so uh, we had talked to several experts, um, looked at kind of the policies that were being created around that time. Um, and so this is like March uh, and April when this uh, was occurring. Um, and so that's where some of that money went, was being able to, to talk about and look, you know, behind the scenes a little bit about some of the evictions that are happening. Um, in addition, uh, Jaylin, a uh, fantastic uh, reporter again, um, she did a lot of our development coverage this year, actually, and I, I spent a lot of uh, my time editing that. Um, and so, J 
And then also uh, earlier on, before the pandemic, um, she had dove into uh, Columbus's budget and did a very detailed write-up um, looking into specifically the development budget. You know, there's a lot of talk um, these days about tax abatements and kind of what the role those play in, in development and uh, securing, uh, you know, job growth, business growth, economic growth, et cetera, here in Columbus. Um, and so I kind of looked at, uh, you know, we looked at the budget. She invested, she went through, you know, uh, thoroughly looked at the budget. We She also compared it to other, you know, regional cities, you know, the big, the, the three cities here, Cleveland and Cincinnati, um, but also looked at, um, I think, Austin, Texas, and, and maybe even Nashville um, and to kind of compare uh, and, and possibly San Francisco, because I think, you know, they're on par yeah. with our numbers as well. Um, and so she looked at, you know, all of those and, and looked at how does this compare, you know, where does Columbus fit in with these other cities who are seeing some similar growth or are the same size in terms of population to us? Um, so what are they spending their development dollars on, right? Um, and within all of this, what we found is that Columbus is actually, uh, there, there's a bit in the budget, um, but it's just, you know, finances CDY, just one line item that is quite a chunk of money. And that is actually one spot where tax abatements are kind of, you know, it, there's not an explicit like tax abatement line item that happens. Um, and so what she kind of found out was that uh, you know, there, there's some kind of more behind the scenes, you know, allocation of money that happens. Um, I remember I, I started uh, first doing a little research on that topic when we decided to cover it. And it was really hard to even compare city budgets because some cities even combine their budget with their county and while some have separate budgets, some, you know, have like you were saying, some might have an actual like I don't know how many have like a line that say, says tax abatement because I know taxes are tricky and the way they're calculated and whatever. And they're not, a, not actually like whatever an allocated part of the budget in some ways, because it's like a tax break on the back end. But just regardless, whatever category you were looking at development, the things within development schools and how those different things kind of um, might relate in, in the different city budgets, the way that they kind of categorize and lay those things out are so different that it's really hard to get like an apples to apples comparison. What I thought was really interesting was, um, yeah, just seeing like how, and definitely go to matternews.org under the develop us tab if you want to see that, um, because it does have some, even though it's kind of hard to compare some of the things I wanted to know about, like how much do they spend on development versus what we spend is a little bit trickier to answer than I thought, but for example, San Francisco, I can't remember what the line item was, but they have some pretty decent size of their budget that goes toward like, I don't remember if it's like public art or like green spaces. It's just like a much bigger budget for sort of cultural art and, and different things, um, in infrastructure that I didn't see in any of any of the other cities we looked at. So I thought that it was just really interesting too to know some cities had whole line items or whole kind of things. I know that the city of Columbus, um, this is a little bit relevant to development. I think it's a separate item in the budget uh, is the Department of Neighborhoods. So I know that's not exactly development, but it does relate to this idea of like neighborhoods and, and how all of that's kind of handled and how people are heard. Um, and the city of Columbus has very much increased its uh, investment in that Department of Neighborhoods and sort of increasing some of that engagement with um, with residents. Um, but it's really interesting also to see kind of the trends and uh, and things in the budget and the comparison. So I appreciate you bringing up that piece because I honestly forgot about it. Yeah, and I actually, one other thing I want to mention about that piece is that um, we use data visualizations in that piece to where you can see exactly, and we include the literal spreadsheet of data uh, within the piece. And so that is a, a firm and core belief of ours is that you should have access to directly to that data and information. Um, and we oftentimes will upload like files directly so you can see them and mess around and look at that information. Um, we'll take the data and put it into visualizations so that way you can have a more accessible look at uh, these numbers because, you know, 
I, I'm a journalist. I'm I'm not a, a super big math person. Now, Jay Lynn, she is the data journalist, and uh, she does great with numbers. Me, on the other hand, not so much. So I got to have her help me out with these sorts of things sometimes. But uh, that that you know is something that we want to you know that is you know programs like that that help us. Um, uh, and, and now that's a free program, for example, um, that we use. Um, I believe it's called Tableau is the one that she uses, but there's multiple different programs out there. Um, but that, you know, that's one easy way that we're able to be, you know, we're able to kind of bring this information a little more to life. Um, and the way, you know, just the fact, you know, Jalen having those skills and being able to do that, um, it, you know, it's, it, you know, it, it's, it makes the reporting so much better when you can have this kind of interactive aspect to it. Um, and that's what I appreciate about um, some of our other pieces that we've done in the past as well. It's just the interactivity and the ability for you to be able to kind of go in and look at the information and see it directly and kind of explore that data, um, I think is really, really important. Um, yeah. Yeah, and we're gonna be talking uh, more in a second about why the Develop Us investigation got a little less attention than we intended this year. But before I pivot to kind of talking about that in our newer investigation, I just want to give you a moment and maybe we could hone in on one because I know there's so many pieces of content that we started on or worked on this year that haven't come out yet. Um, why don't we just real quick talk about corridor concepts? I think that's one of our biggest pieces that's being worked on. Um, and I know it's changed some, so I'm sorry, I forget where exactly we're at with it. And whatever you want to tell the people about what form it will be is fine, but just tell them a little bit about what that story is and why we found that in 2020. And we're like, okay, this is a story we want to cover. And, and what kind of medium are we currently thinking we'll tell that story in? Yeah, so um, so I believe in 2019, uh, the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Committee, uh, MORPC for short, uh, released a corridor concepts study that looked at five different corridors within the city of Columbus. There's like a Northwest, a Northeast, a Southwest, Southeast, and one more. Um, and so uh, these are uh, going to be turned into kind of just just uh, mega development corridors, um, including uh, what's known as bus rapid transit. So they're going to have dedicated bus lanes on these corridors. And so, um, you know, the Middle Ohio Regional Planning Committee uh, released this big study in 2019. And we've been diving into this plan for about the last year, kind of picking it apart, pulling it apart, uh, you know, trying to figure out the nuances of the plan, how it's going to affect everyday people, as well as how it's gonna, you know, change the landscape of our city. Um, so essentially this report says that um, what Columbus should do to prepare for, you know, the, uh, you know, more than a million folks that are gonna be here uh, by 2050 uh, is that they need to concentrate the majority, uh, I think it's like 60% of um, businesses. Um, I might have these statistics uh, flipped, but it's 60% of businesses and 40% of housing um, on these corridors. So you're going to see a lot of mid-level, mid-rise uh, building. Uh, you know, so I, I live uh, in Hilltop. One of the corridors is going from downtown, all of these start in downtown and go out essentially kind of to the suburbs. Um, so the one that, you know, one goes out uh, down uh, Broad Street, uh, towards West Broad Street, all the way out, um, you know, past 270, essentially. One goes out to kind of the Canal Pickerington area. Another one goes out to Dublin and Westerville area. Um, I'm sorry, Dublin and um, New Albany area um, on those other corridors. And so, um, long story short, we've been diving into this this uh, big plan for the last year and interviewing folks. And originally, we're going to do a five part uh, mini series, kind of a box style uh, for fans of box, a box style explainer series, um, just short uh, three minute uh, clips on each aspect of the the, the plan, so looking at transportation, looking at housing business growth, um, looking at the walkability uh, of neighborhoods and like what kind of the neighborhood design will be. Um, and then kind of lumping in everything else of what else do we really need to know about this? What other questions do we have? Um, and so after spending some time scripting this out over the last year and doing the research, um, our reporter, uh, Khalil Newton and I kind of came to the conclusion that this uh, might be better represented in a podcast um, rather than a video series. That way it has the uh, ability to kind of evolve over time. Um, and so it can be more of a living 
uh, uh, document, so to speak, you know, uh, audio document, um, rather than uh, a video that is a little bit more static and, uh, you know, it's a little bit more difficult to kind of produce a, a video uh, and, and change a lot of the scripting and, you know, there's just a whole big process behind that. So what we're doing instead is turning it into a podcast based on those topics that I mentioned earlier, like transportation, housing, and business development. Um, and then from those podcast topics, um, we'll choose a couple, uh, you know, difficult to explain um, concepts within them, and then pull from that to do a video explainer um, that helps uh, kind of supplement the audio uh, story that you'll be hearing. Um, and so we're really excited about this. Um, it kind of allows the project to expand and, like I said, be more of a living project. Um, and we'll be able to watch, uh, you know, this is this is a 2050 plan. So we're we're looking at this project as a very long-term project. Um, you know, for now, we're kind of trying to just get the information out about it as our first stage. Just kind of here's the summary of what this is, um, and then be able to follow the story um, as updates uh, are made to the, the quarter concepts plan. Um, because there are, because there's a whole, you know, when it comes to you know regional and government planning and city planning, uh, you have study after study after study that's done, and then on top of those studies, you have what are known as implementation plans. So you have a study that tells you like, okay, here are the things that you could or should implement, and then on top of that, they'll look at all of these other studies, kind of take what they want, and then say, this is the plan we're going to implement. So you have kind of all of this background information that you have to sift through, um, and then the actual, you know, action that the city is going to take uh, to follow through on the plans that they've laid out. So there's a lot that goes into kind of producing a really big piece like this because, you know, there are hundreds of pages of documents that Khalil is looking into um, and, you know, so many people to get in contact with um, to understand kind of the nuances of this. And so a piece like this takes a really long time to produce because there is just so much research that goes into it um, because this is huge. And it's not something that's really talked about because it's huge, right? Like it would, it had, you know, we've been working on diving into this for a year. Um, not, it, there's not a lot of, you know, there's, there's not a lot of fate, you know, there's not a lot of opportunity uh, in a lot of newsrooms to be able to do that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And people can choose the things that, you know, are gonna have the most impact. Well, we've kind of decided to, you know, as, as many of you who've been following along, uh, who've been following us for a minute may know, we're diving into individual topics like one at a time. So, you know, we're looking at development, we're looking at policing, um, and that allows us to kind of dive into these things a little bit more um, and bring out some of that detail that you're not going to have here in a 600 word story, you know, once every couple of months. So that's what we're trying to do is kind of breathe more life into these things um, and also produce them in a way that's like innovative and, you know, most importantly, entertaining. Uh, city planning can be really boring. Uh, you know, I'm a geek about that kind of thing. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of you are out there, but, you know, policies and documents and reading through, you know, all these studies, it, it's not the most exciting thing for a lot of people. So what we're trying to do is make it, you know, make learning about what's happening in our community, uh, you know, an entertaining thing as well. And that's why we're trying to kind of create a multimedia project around this. Um, because it's gonna drastically change, you know, I don't know about you, Cass, but I plan on being in Columbus for at least the next 10, 20, 30 years. And, uh, you know, uh, we're gonna be here to see this change, right? And so people need to know what these changes are gonna be and how it's gonna affect their lives. Uh, people in Victorian Village and German Village are already really upset that they're getting high-rise developments, but the fact of the matter is it's it's just gonna keep coming. And I think people, you know, because we haven't seen, we haven't, we haven't like been able to watch the full picture as it's happened, we kind of get these pieces as they're going. We don't see a whole congruent you know, comprehensive picture, I think it can be hard for a lot of us, even myself, to kind of process like the changes that are going to happen in this plan. So I've been talking a lot about this particular uh, story, but it, it, there's just so much that goes into it. So I'm really excited about that. Um, and that's one of our biggest projects right now uh, in Develop, uh, Develop Us. So yeah, I know I was open up a can of worms with that one, but I think it's something that as I talk to people, I keep finding that people have not even heard about it yet. And it, it truly is going to impact the future of Columbus. And once again, if you have not heard about it, it's called Corridor Concepts. We don't currently have much out about it, so do check out other 
um, sources of information or let us know if you personally need or want more information, we can send you the study. Um, but the thing that really struck me and, and what I love, you tied around things that I was going to bring up at the end with like the beauty of matter and what we're really doing with a story like this, because I remember the story started with me going to, uh, at the time I was working on more of our editorial content and I went to a, uh, a speech given by the city that basically unveiled publicly for the first time this study. And it was Shannon Hardin, uh, city council president. It was the CODA, um, I'm gonna blank on her name, but the woman uh, was CODA. Pinkerton, I believe Pinkerton. it's her last. Uh, Joanna? Joanna, there we go. Pinkerton, uh, Dakota CEO, I don't remember what her title is. Yeah, and then um, they actually flew in the person from the uh, from the firm, I think that's you know based somewhere out west that actually prepared the modeling and, and sort of came up with a lot of the research. One of the things that I thought was extremely fascinating is that the guy said that it's their software is like Sim City, but for real. And that's pretty much what they're doing is like, what if we build this here in Columbus? What do we build this here? And their model says like, what would theoretically happen or whatever. So I thought, A, that's really fascinating that at the end of the day, he said like a computer is modeling these things, but he also said, the real work comes with the humans that are implementing these computer plans. Um, and, you know, there's only so much that the computer at the end of the day can say in, in terms of how you should develop your city and the rest of that needs to come from community input. And I remember, uh, I'm, I'm just like, oh, it was Steve Shoney at the time was the direct, director of development. So he was also out there. And him and, and Joanna, to some extent, were basically saying, now the actual work starts we have this plan which i'm like they say they did stake a lot of stakeholder engagement i think for a plan like that more people in the community probably should have known about it ahead of time and been truly stakeholding in that um in my my humble opinion but regardless we have this plan now it's huge but they're also saying now is when we actually come up with like you said implementation plans now is where we actually are ready to hear from people now is where people can apply pressure on us in terms of the way that some of these things actually goes down so like you said instead of just kind of a one and done we are working on making this more of an ongoing story i love that we were uh you know not only you as an editor and and jaylen and um, Khalil, but also Khalil as a content creator is not only versatile enough, but also, um, you know, flexible enough uh, to really take the story in the direction it needs to go and be multimedia and really uh, give our give our uh, audience the, the education and, and innovation they deserve when it comes to news content. So love that as an example. Now, we do not have ton, a ton, a ton more time and we do have a lot more ground to cover. So we're going to try to cover it pretty quick. Um, and a lot of you, honestly, we've been talking a lot about some of the next things we're going to talk about. And it's a lot of what's been consuming us lately. So at least to us, it doesn't feel that new. So I, we probably won't spend too, too much time uh, talking about it. But I do definitely want to touch on it because it's been honestly a huge part of 2020. So uh, when the when the pandemic hit, you know, we, we determined that we really couldn't do the pandemic justice, the level of research, the level of coverage, it's happening all over the country. And each city is generally, you know, of course, there's different rates and different situations in each place, but it's a national story. It's an international story. It's something that's being covered by a lot of people. Whereas when the protests happen uh, and, the, and the uprisings really across the country in May, um, we started not only seeing ourselves a big gap in local coverage, but we were also getting people actually coming to us, asking us proactively for coverage of protests and policing in Columbus. So I gave away a little spoiler, spoiler to the question I was gonna ask, but um, basically Marissa, and I know we've talked about this a bit, but some of the people listening might not have heard. Walk us through just a little bit what happened at those first weekend of protests in Columbus uh, and what what led to our decision to open this new investigation, which is called Crossing the Line. It's been open since early June of, of 2020, and it's about all about Columbus policing. So just tell us a bit about how we ended up. And, and I will, I meant to also uh, set us up this way right before the uprisings and the protests started we had just done strategic planning and we had decided that we would open our next investigation after development in 2025 
And we also decided that we would uh, hire our first employees, uh, at least Marissa and I part-time so that we could, we could work on matter more in April of next year. So those plans sped up in one case by five years in one by like eight months. Um, but tell us why things sped up and why. Absolutely. So, um, when the protests first started happening, you know, when, when George Floyd's life was taken away, um, you know, things, things, uh, started sparking here in Columbus. Um, Columbus is no stranger to police violence. Columbus is no stranger to police brutality. Families, black families have been talking about this for decades. It's been something that has been embedded in our community because of things like gentrification, because of things like redlining, because of historic discriminatory practices that have oppressed communities for decades, you know? And so with all of that in mind, you know, we, you know, at the time of these protests, right, we were just covering development. We had just done strategic planning. But me as a journalist, I couldn't not go out there um, and try to cover things from, a, you know, uh, an independent perspective. Um, I went out there uh, to kind of act as a freelance journalist um, when the first protest was uh, scheduled. Uh, I believe it was uh, the 26th. Um, this is a Wednesday or a th I think it was a Thursday night, um, which was one of the first protests. Um, sorry, the first protest was the Christopher uh, Radin protest, uh, I believe, which was, no, they were the, I think it was the night before. Yeah. Um, Wednesday, and then Wednesday night before the national protests erupted, um, go on our website, matternews.org's, uh, policing tab and look at, scroll down to find Christopher Radin. Um, he was the original protester in Columbus who, because of George Floyd, but before the protests really came to Columbus, he was out in the streets protesting in a South Side, near South Side neighborhood, um, and ended up getting, uh, I mean, in my opinion, from reviewing the, the footage, um, roughed up and, uh, and, and assaulted really by the police um, while he was on the sidewalk, um, and they ended up arresting him. Uh, and we just briefly, really just briefly mentioned what the situation was, but mainly just put out a five minute video of him telling his account of the story. We often see um, police reports uh, in a lot of articles that come out that pretty much regurgitate the official narrative of what might have happened in a, in a certain situation, and especially because this one caused protests to actually start happening a day before the protests really uh, erupted on Thursday, and there were actually protests Wednesday night in Columbus. Um, it was really significant. A lot of people that I was uh, on the ground seeing at the protest Thursday night had no idea why we were protesting at Livingston and Lockbourne. They had no idea we were on the South Side because of Christopher Radden. They thought we were just out there for George Floyd. So I think matters, you know, putting that story out there and, and the coverage, um, you know, that you were doing uh, and I was out there doing, you know, just as a freelancer, at least at the time, was super important and, and really did show a gap that there was in the media that, that certain things weren't being covered, even from the very beginning of, of these these protests. Yeah, exactly. And so when we had gone out there, like, like we said, we just went out there kind of on our own personal platforms, acting as freelance journalists. Um, and, uh, you know, I went out there uh, that Thursday night, and that was when the first pepper spray happened. And um, I, I've been to actions and demonstrations for racial uh, discrimination and, and police brutality in the past. Um, you know, when Henry Green uh, and Tyree King uh, were uh, shot and killed, um, you know, th those were actions that I had, uh, you know, attended in the past. And I'd seen how police officers had acted during those uh, instances. You know, they brought out the bike cops. They, uh, you know, tried to tell people to get on sidewalks and... But ultimately, there was no, there was really no physicality in a lot of that. Uh, and in the I thing can confirm over the last like six, seven years being in Columbus and having been to a lot of protests, 
I can confirm exactly what you're saying too, that I've seen the same thing, that there's occasionally been the, the quarrel here and there with a protester and the bikes tend to be a thing, especially when they're holding a line and trying to keep the protesters on the sidewalk. I've seen instances where a cop's, kind, you know, kind of rough someone up or there's been back and forth, but there haven't been very many instances, I think, other than maybe the Black Pride 4 at um, Community Pride, or sorry, at, at uh, Corporate Stonewall Pride, Pride, that one, or Stonewall Pride, um, that one year. And then uh, other than that, yet, like you're saying, generally, I haven't seen or heard of major con conflicts with police and protesters up to that point. And I will just say to lead into what you're saying about being downtown, I was at Livingston and Lockport and Marissa said, I'm d downtown, there's a different protest. And I'm thinking, you know, I don't know. She, I think when I talked to you too, it, there weren't, there wasn't huge crowds or anything, but I get down there right after dark and poor Marissa here has already been pepper sprayed. And I'm like, what? We get down there, the, the demonstration hasn't been going on at all. And it was almost mass chaos already. So yeah, what had happened was they had actually started, and, and this is another thing, the the protest, I was seeing, the protest started at 750 East Long Street, um, which was outside of a, a government building. I am struggling to remember which one right now. But when I had saw uh, local news reports of the protest, it, so they started at 750 East Long Street, and they marched from there to the intersection of Broad and High Street. Uh, and, and then that's when the police came, the police had been following them. Um, as soon as they start, you know, maybe, maybe 60 to a hundred feet after they had started marching in the street, the police started coming, uh, and kind of following them. And, you know, the protesters would go and the police would like try to stop them, you know, and, and then the, the, the they would just walk around them and then the cops would move back. And so it was just like that kind of back and forth, like going forward from long East Long Street all the way to downtown. Now, some of the initial reports that I saw from local outlets had said that the entire protest started downtown. I was there where they started at 750 East Long Street and knew that that was, I mean, from the start, like, you know, details about how and when and who were already becoming messy. Um, and so, you know, that was like in the first, you know, the day after I had been down there, um, that was something that I noticed. And so, yeah, so, you know, I think the, the protest started at uh, like seven. We, uh, it, the folks had uh, kind of left that, that location, 750 East Long Street, around 730, I believe. And around eight o'clock, uh, I mean, it probably took us half an hour to get there. Folks are probably around for maybe 10, 15, 30 minutes max in that kind of intersection. Um, multiple police officers come. And within that first 30 minutes, like between 7.30 and 8, between 8 and 8.30, um, pepper spray happened. The, the protesters had been downtown for 30 minutes. Um, and so... Uh, it, and we were all right there. And, and folks really, you know, they had the pepper spray out. And I don't think folks were really expecting that uh i know i was not expecting to to go down uh and and be sprayed as i'm filming this uh but at the time you know uh we weren't covering this so i wasn't very clearly you know marked as media and not that you know in, in some of these instances it, it gets it gets a little tricky with things like that so anyways cassie and Lynn had had similar experiences of kind of seeing how things were being talked about, you know, the immediate you and, and that night after the first pepper spray, the pepper spray happened before any property damage was done before anybody threw any bricks or, you know, had had, you know, thrown any water bottles at police officers. Um, you know, the pepper spray was done before any riots had started. And that was my biggest issue, was seeing the way that these things were framed um, immediately out of the gate when no one was being violent, no one was causing property damage in that, in, you know, that first hour and a half. And then pepper spray came out because the crowd wasn't dispersing. Um, and we've seen now that uh, the city, you know, they don't want that to be used as a crowd dispersal tactic. Um, 
So we've kind of seen how that has transitioned over the past, uh, you know, several months. Um, so I feel like I'm kind of just rambling. No, this you're point. no, you're great. You, that was a great explanation, and I really appreciate that you kind of. Um, I I didn't want to interrupt at the time, but you gave a a perfect explanation also of what we ended up calling the investigation. So, crossing the line is the name of the investigation. Riss was kind of describing how like the thing that we didn't really see in the media, one of the things was uh, that they weren't really accurately portraying the way that the protests were actually moving. They weren't really getting in there. A lot of, you know, our live streams and different things were really all, you know, Marissa was up in there getting sprayed, whereas other outlets sometimes are sitting back with their bigger cameras and their crews. And um, really, Marissa, I think, might have, or Jalen came up with the name, but they were talking about how the line, Marissa said the line looks very different every night. We were out there for a whole summer, and the line of protesters, the line of police, it looked different no, ma you know, no matter when you were out there, depending on what the action was, where they physically were, what they were trying to achieve. And so, um, and just depending on how, uh, you know, ready for with riot gear the police were so there were all kinds of really interesting dynamics and like you said this whole crossing the line um investigation so it not only has to do with that whole idea but also the idea that the police have crossed the line we know from some of the things the mayor has said afterward and some of the policies that have been put in place that even the government agrees has said you know that they agree that the police response was inappropriate that it was too much there now has been, and this will be a little segue, um, you know, there was even an investigation by Baker Hostetler, the, the city uh, hired a firm. And if you're not aware, uh, uh, they actually did an investigation. So they took all kinds of complaints. If you remember emailing like complaints at cbd.gov or whatever it was during the protests, technically you should have heard from this law firm um, who uh, pretend, I don't know if you would have for sure, but, the, but if they found one of your claims uh, valid or sounding valid, they were supposed to follow up with you and look into that. Um, and so Marissa, uh, I would love for you to talk a little bit about after, so just for a moment, for those who don't know, spoiler alert, where we're going with this, we ended up opening an investigation into policing. Um, we were not only seeing for ourselves, like Marissa said, very clear instances. I remember, and I can't remember if it was 10, 6, or 4, but I think it was Channel 10 locally, and, and don't quote me for sure, uh, but one of the major networks, TV networks, they even had one of their broadcasters um, post a photo of a news truck with a broken front window saying, look what these animals at the protest did using the language animals uh to describe protesters and especially the crowds being uh, to describe, of protesters of color. and in and, and the way that i and, and you know that's that kind of language not only the use of the word animals to describe a human uh which you know we are human whatever but just to use that language that it's dehumanizing one is you know not okay at all um uh but two if you these are everyone here is my neighbor like I this is my community and I'm reporting on my community and trying to figure out information for my community obviously my community is very upset and is grieving and is not doing okay right now and I can't I just really can't think of a world like where like that kind of thing is okay to say about the people that like it, and, and to me, that just shows a little bit of the out of touchness of why people don't understand. And we've talked about this, you know, when we talk about objectivity and the white central objectivity in media. Um, and, you know, I'm up here talking about this as a white woman. Um, but that's we have to we have to talk about that and break down those barriers of what white objectivity looks like in media. And if we don't have those conversations, we get reporters who are calling people animals. And that's not okay. We, that's really not okay. Yeah. And so it's things, you know, obvious like that, that we saw out there and that we really witnessed, but it was also the outpouring that we got from the people who were tuning in. So like Marissa said, we were not actually, we did not immediately open in, an investigation over that weekend. We pretty much just spent all of our time out there trying to cover this on our own social media accounts so that people would know what was happening. And we just had messages pouring in. We had people tagging Matter News to check us out for the most reliable protest coverage. 
And so our audience was really begging for this over the last couple of years when we told people we would eventually open a new investigation. A good portion of those people said that policing was their their local number one concern. So we These really- People have been asking us ever since we started Matter to look mm-hmm. into policing and to specifically okay. dive into that topic. But we, you know- it, Having started out, you know, we just thought that development was just something with our, our small amount of resources that we could much easier, you know, handle much easy, much more easily. Uh, yeah, definitely. And so what ended up happening was we were like, you know, we really feel like this is a clear need from the community. We strive to be a community informed newsroom. And even though we didn't intend to open our next investigation this way, we're feeling compelled to do so. So we went ahead. We didn't close our development investigation, but it has been a little bit on hold this year. Not a lot of content's been coming out in the last six months for that, but we very much are still have it alive. Um, it will remain open for probably quite some time, and it's been open for a couple of years. So definitely stay tuned for more development coverage. Marissa is the, the editor for that issue, so please let her know if you have any news tips or anything like that. Um, In terms of this new investigation, though, it's taking up most of our attention right now, a lot of our time, um, a lot of the newer contributors and content that we have coming out um, are uh, with this investigation into policing in Columbus. And so, like I said, one of the first pieces of content we put out was uh, about Christopher Radden and the story of what happened with him when he he first started protesting. Um, But we've had other pieces since then that have dived into things like what have uh, the police been using? Because people were asking all kinds of questions about what kind of chemical agents were being used. Sarah, um, oh, and I'm, can you pull her last name out for me right now? Because I'm completely forgetting. But there was a young woman, um, Sarah, and I'm completely blanking on her last name, who um, was killed during a protest because, uh, uh, likely, gr- because, yeah. Do you remember her last name? Uh, I don't want to butcher it, so I'm I'm looking it up. If you can I'm... look it up for me, um, I don't want to leave out her last name, but she, uh, you know, may have died from some of the from exposure sure, to Grossman. some of them. No, it found out that it was not that. Just they it, they said they found out that it was not because of that. So. So the autopsy shows that it's a pre-existing condition she had. Um, So there's not proof that I think that it's, there's no proof that that chemical caused her death or anything like that. But people like her who are out at the protest who have pre-existing conditions that have um, asthma and different breathing issues um, are susceptible to uh, potentially having issues if they're exposed to some of those chemicals and especially a lot of them. So there's just been a lot of questions about what gases were even used out there. A lot of people didn't even know what they were putting themselves at risk for because they didn't know, like you said, that the city would even respond in that way in the first place if we're talking the first day of protests. I remember people coming out even, you know, during and and they just weren't prepared. And so I think if you really take a look at our site, especially if you're going to be going out to protests or you were at protests, you're going to see us answering some of those questions that you want to know um, more recently. And so we don't have very much time, but I want to talk about a couple of recent things. Um, that we're working on uh, with that investigation. And then we'll get off here. Um, One is the Casey Goodson Jr. case. So I just want to let everyone who's tuning in know that we are covering that case very closely. If you think about the fact that we are um, with this, with the, uh, we did get a small influx of donations, um, more than what we typically see during the protests, especially because we were really out there covering live and we were putting out a lot of content. We are really appreciative that people really supported us. We got comments that that people felt safer because of our live streams, and we got a little infusion of donations. What we did with that money is we hired our first part-time editor, Tommy Mead, Um, and so he's not with us all the time, but please do reach out to him because he is um, at least able to be with us part-time to work on uh, our crossing line investigation. Um, And... Uh, Jalen uh, Grisso is the editor in chief, so she's also involved. You know her, and then Marissa is also creating a lot of the content and tag teaming on the editing. Um, and so, uh, a lot of the recent content has been about Casey Goodson Jr. We do, like we said, cover things in this way where we're trying to cover in one issue in Columbus, like policing, in a very comprehensive way. We are also trying to do that for specific cases within these topics as well. Like Marissa was talking about with corridor concepts, that's one example. And another one for uh, the policing investigation is Casey Goodson Jr. Um, If you're unaware, he is a young black man who was killed 
uh, by a a Franklin County Sheriff um, a couple of, uh, two two or three weeks ago now. We have a lot of content, a live blog that we're updating on our website that talk about that case, but it's gotten a lot of national attention and we truly believe it has a lot of the um, dynamics at play that can really help us dive into a lot of these issues in Columbus. For example, um, if you've heard, there's going to be a civilian review board for independent reviews of um, uh, deaths uh, on the part of police uh, against uh, against civilians. Um, that will not be in play for this case. And Marissa dives into you know why that is or what will actually be the investigation that will take place. Why isn't the civilian review board? And then she's going to be putting out another piece that talks about more in depth about the review board and what it will do. Um, so we're really trying to tackle this case and all of the related parts um, from a bunch of different angles. And please do uh, add anything now about the about that case or investigation. Well, really, what I want to add is that, like, I had a so a lot of the, the pieces that I've been writing, um, and I think just, you know, we're getting a little bit of extra audio uh, kind of feedback. Um, uh, so a lot of the um isaiah if you can mute yourself i think it might be creating feedback for marissa try again marissa see if um, it's better uh so yeah yeah uh, i guess it's not uh i think that okay i think we're good all right so yeah so what i wanted to add is that um you know the the civilian review board content uh story that i put out um, you know, no, the COVID civilian review board isn't going to review Casey Goodson's case. Um, I'm, you know, I'm a big kind of Twitter person and I'm on there a lot and I'm really just trying to monitor kind of what questions people are asking. And I also have a lot of you coming to me asking questions. And so that was a question I kept seeing everyone ask and that I was being asked from people was, well, hey, didn't we just vote for, you know, this police reform last month? literally last month. And so people were asking that question. Um, in a lot of stories, it's just kind of a line item, right? Like, oh, no, this, well, of course, it's the the civilian review board isn't going to review it because it only has jurisdiction in, for Columbus police. Okay, well, poli- a lot of people aren't going in and checking our city's charter. Um, you know, that that's not something most people are doing. So they're not going to know the exact language or remember the exact language that was on the ballot. So I thought it was really important that people have, you know, a really thorough understanding of why we're not seeing uh why our you know our civilian review board will not be reviewing this so multiple people ask me questions and you know your money goes towards me answering the questions you have about your community like at the end of the day that's what we're trying to do um and that and that's my goal is to make sure i'm you know trying to investigate and uncover things that hold truth to power but also get you answers to questions you have about the things that you're voting for about the things that your elected officials are putting dollars behind. Um, and, and so really that's, you know, I just want to put it out there that you can always come and talk to us about any questions or comments or concerns you have about, um, you know, things that you're seeing come up and, and, you know, like our stories are, are directly, you know, related to the things that people are, you know, wanting to, to know about in their community. Uh, so, yeah. And I think we, you know, we are absolutely willing to put our money where our mouth is when we say that, because, this new investigation, like we said, we didn't, our plan was five more years before we opened that thing. Uh, did we want to stress ourselves out, burn ourselves out, uh, covering protests all summer when we were in the second year and finally kind of getting a hold on our news operation? No, we didn't, but we did it for you. We are continuing to cover live protests as much as we can. We can't guarantee we'll be out there all the time, but as part of this placing investigation, um, we have really felt compelled because of a lot of the feedback we've gotten because how much people have told us those live streams really help them, especially in the time of COVID, be able to understand what's going on in their city when they can't actually be them there themselves um, has been really uh, important to us to hear that feedback. And so whether you're a donor, whether you just tune into our content, follow us on social, please do connect with us, make a comment, just let us know what about what we're doing really is helping you or what you want to see from us. And just know we won't be able to take every news tip. We won't be able to do everything that you suggest, but please know that we do consider it. And if we hear five people ask the same question or say that they think live streams are the most important thing we do, then we will burn ourselves out going to protests or 
or you know find the budget to do it uh so that we can make sure that happens for y'all so we are very open within our model to really be your community newsroom and we appreciate you guys giving us that feedback um and really participating in the shaping of this uh this community uh of news content uh that we're that this body of news content we're creating so we're really about at time now me and marissa said oh let's try to make this thing like a half hour we can cut it off <laughs> after and of course we should have known ourselves we we couldn't talk about our whole year in less than an hour so thank you yes. Marissa, so much for bearing with me on and taking us through so much great content that was created in 2020 it's all at matternews.org you can donate to support all of it at matternews.org slash donate five dollar suggested donation thank you so much to night road studio and wild goose creative for being our sponsors marissa any closing words before we say goodbye to everybody um thank you all so much for tuning in um i really really appreciate you taking the time out to you know stop by say hello i know we're a little bit late today we're sorry um but seriously drop by you know give us a shout you know come talk to us we really want to be open and available to communicate with our community about these things um and and make it a two-way conversation because it should be a two-way conversation we should be able to kind of meet you where you're at uh and figure out what your needs are as a community uh so yeah and lastly i just want to thank isaiah shout out to him his artist name is unknown and he is releasing a, a track today called crossing the line which is uh, inspired partially by our investigation crossing the line it's a song that's packed with a lot of themes of uh, policing and issues in Columbus and beyond. So uh, definitely check him out, check that track out. And thank you, Isaiah, for getting our live stream right every, every week. We will see you all next Monday at 7 p.m. for our final uh, live stream of this season of Matter Monday. We thank you and we love you and stay safe. Bye, everyone. Have, a, have happy holidays for sure. Stay yeah. safe, stay warm, and care for each other. Yes. <laughs>